Well, good evening. I hope and pray that you're doing well this evening uh, in these challenging times that we're living. And it's a joy to come to you tonight with the word of the Lord that I hope will be of an encouragement to you, a help to you, to strengthen your faith and to remind you of some really good and important things. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that in these changing times, you're the unchanging one. From eternity to eternity, you are God. You're immutable. You do not change. And so, Lord, help us in these days, Lord, to fix our eyes by faith through Holy Scripture upon you, our God. And, Lord, even the word we have this evening, how precious it is to remind us of these truths. May your people feed upon the word of God. May faith come by hearing and hearing by the word this evening. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Psalms and it's Psalm number 107. Psalm 107. And based upon what we see in this lengthy psalm, I've titled the lesson, Our Merciful Deliverer. Now, doesn't that have a good sound to it? Our merciful, like that, he is a God of mercy, deliverer. You know, it's wonderful for us to appreciate not only what the Lord does for us, but who the Lord is to us. We need to keep both in mind in our giving thanks. Be thankful for who God is. In fact, I'd add to that, be thankful that he's not the God of other people's making. He's not like the, the God of the Greeks or the Romans. He's not a moody, capricious God. But he is the one true living God. And be grateful for that. He's righteous. He's just. He's perfect. And yet he's also compassionate. He's kind. He's benevolent. And yes, indeed, God is love. But he's also a deliverer. He's one who saves He's one who, as we will see this evening, rescues. And so this is a wonderful psalm, and we'll take it bit by bit due to its length. But I want you to uh, note with me right now how that this psalm is so obviously divided. Five times the psalmist makes a very similar statement. In fact, some of them are verbatim. But note how it is divided in verse number one. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Verse 8, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 15, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. You see, identical. And verse 21, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And verse 31, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Repeatedly, the psalmist is either uh, given an exhortation or he's explaining folks his desire. Oh, that men would uh, praise the Lord and give thanks to him. And so I, I trust this evening that whatever might be going on in your life right now, and of course, as we're all uh, fully aware of things happening in our world and our communities, oh, that this would help you this evening. Did you ever have someone, maybe it was your mother or your spouse, but someone was talking to you and maybe, maybe you were supposedly listening, but your eyes turned away while they were talking and perhaps it might have been your little child when they were very young and they reached up and they just turned and pushed your face back to where you would be looking at them. This psalm does that this evening. With all of the attractions and the distractions that we have going on around us, whether those things that are personal in your own life with you and your family or the things we see uh, socially that we see uh, in our nation, may the scripture tonight Turn your eyes toward the Lord 
and help you. And you may recall those my age and older, how they used to speak about school and in days of old, they would learn the three R's. Remember that? Reading, writing, writing, and arithmetic. Well, there's three R's in our psalm this evening. Based upon the scripture, we're going to find three R's. And so you keep that in mind as we work our way through this psalm. Now, there's a lot of repetition. For instance, there's also four times in this psalm of where the psalmist, uh, he, he describes the same scenario, and you'll see this repeatedly. In fact, it's verse 6, 13, 19, and 28, that because of the circumstance, he will say of the people that they cried out to the Lord. And then he will add to that, that the Lord, he delivered them, or he saved them, or he brings them out of their distresses. See why I titled this, Our Merciful Deliverer? Well, let's just get right into this. And each time we just kind of draw our wagons together around a portion of the psalm and work through it. In verse one through seven, we see, first of all, that the Lord redeems his people. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. He led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Please note the psalmist is calling upon a certain people now. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. This matter of redemption is the testimony of the saints. That's how he identified the believers there. They are the redeemed of the Lord. In verse two, he talks about how that such people have been freed by the Redeemer. He has redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Oh, we know that to be true, right? The Lord has freed us from the domain and the sway and the authority of the enemy. We are now servants of righteousness instead of sin and Satan. The Redeemer has freed us. Furthermore, in verse three and four, he tells that these people have been found by the Redeemer. He describes them as nomadic, as, as wandering around, he says, in the wilderness, that they had no city to dwell in. That's a picture of lostness, isn't it? One of the things we love about heaven is that heaven is our home. And the Lord gave us that wonderful promise that he's gone to prepare a place for us that we might live there with him and be with him. Heaven is our real home. We do not have a permanent home here. It's all temporary. Life here is like living in a hotel. It's only gonna last for so long. But one of these days we're going home because the Lord found us. Remember, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He found, you didn't find the Lord. The Lord found you. In verse five, he speaks here about how that the Lord fed his people, that we're fed by the Redeemer. He says, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted. Jesus said, blessed are they that what? Hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled or they shall be satisfied. Oh, the riches of his grace, his glory, his goodness, the bounty the Lord has for our sin-starved souls. We come to him and we partake. You know, very often Jesus gave uh, illustrations like that, telling the story of, of a, a wealthy man preparing a, a banquet and inviting people to come and eat. Come, come and dine. 
And we have illustrations even of the Lord himself where he prepared a meal and he told the disciples, come. It was ready for them to eat. You never find in any of these uh, where there was not enough. He took just a few loaves of bread and some fish and he fed the multitudes with leftovers. What does that tell us? The Lord is quite capable of meeting and fulfilling and surpassing the needs in our lives. And then also, it's not only a testimony of, of the saints, how what these things the Lord has done for us, but now as his people, we are following the Redeemer. Verse seven, he led them forth by the right way. Now there is a way that seems right, but it's wrong. The way that is right has the Lord as the leader. He's the shepherd. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Hey, are you following the Lord today? If you're following the Lord, you're going the right way. If you're not following the Lord, you are in jeopardy of ending in a terrible manner. Follow the Lord. His way leads to life everlasting. And so this matter of being redeemed, redemption is the testimony of the saints. But then also redemption is the thrust of the scriptures. It is the emphasis of the Bible, this matter of redemption. Now, now the meaning of redemption, to, to redeem, it, it is to cover, and we think they're about atoning, but it is included in the word of redeem. It is to deliver, to save, to purchase, or to pay. The Holman Bible Dictionary says, in the Old Testament, the terms and ideas are frequently used symbolically to emphasize dramatically the redemptive or saving activity of God. So you have illustrations and events that help us to appreciate this matter of God redeeming us. For instance, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, we're told this is after Adam and Eve have rebelled, they've disobeyed, they've sinned, that the Bible says the Lord took skins, animal skins, and made coverings uh, for them. You see, redeem has to do with that matter of even of covering. Uh, Exodus uh, 11 and 12 is where you have the account of the 10th and the final plague uh, that comes upon Egypt, and it's the death of the firstborn. Well, what was the answer for Israel? It was for the lamb to be slain and the blood to be applied around the door. And remember the Lord said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. It is also said in the Bible of how the Lord redeemed the people from, from Egypt in Exodus 6, verse 6. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. See, he's thinking there, I'm going, to redeem, I'm going to deliver you, save you from Egypt. The book of Leviticus, of course, is given greatly to the matter of the sacrificial system that was under the law. A very strict, uh, precise manner by which the animals were to be taken and slain and the blood offered. <clears throat> Leviticus 16 in particular uh, tells us about the Day of Atonement, that annual holy day of where the priest, the high priest, would enter into the most holy place and there on the Ark of the Covenant would sprinkle the blood in behalf of the nation. Later, Jesus would come and Jesus now is our Passover. The book of Ruth has wonderful symbolism in it about the kinsman redeemer. Uh, Ruth was uh, desperate. Her husband had died. She lived with her mother-in-law. Her father-in-law had also died. And here are these two uh, widow women living uh, there in Bethlehem. And they were very much in, uh, uh, in a sad state. And yet there was one named Boaz who was willing to fulfill the role of the kinsman redeemer. And he came and he, he paid the price necessary and he married Ruth. It's a beautiful story of romance, but also of, of redemption. He paid the price. 
Uh, Isaiah 53, what a classic chapter. You should read that chapter if you never have and go back and read it periodically. For there it speaks about the suffering servant, the one who would come and, and who would uh, give his life in sacrifice and die a cruel death, but yet it's not for himself, but for the sake of others. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He died in our stead. Matthew 26, in verse 26 through 30, where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, and there were the bread and the cup memorialize his body and his blood, which is the New Testament for you and for me. Hebrews 9, 22 sums it up by telling us that the shedding of blood is essential if there's going to be forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says there is no remission. And then other verses such as uh, Acts 20, 28, of where Paul speaking uh, to the Ephesians said, take uh, heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Colossians 1, 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption not only is the testimony of the saints, it is the thrust of the scriptures. You cannot read the Bible without seeing that scarlet web that weaves its way all the way through, that thread of redemption. And then also redemption is the triumph of the Savior, that he has succeeded in procuring for us the means by which you and I can be right with God. He has paid the ultimate price. Uh, there's the witness of his resurrection. I mean, that, that tells us Jesus was victorious. If he was still in the grave, he died a death no different from us. But because he overcame death and the grave, he walked out of that. And that tells us he did what he said he was going to do. He accomplished what he set out to do. And in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, you, you read that chapter, you'll see where Peter, as he's testifying to the presence of the Holy Spirit by which those men were able to speak the gospel and people heard it in their various dialects, he said, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And he's, he's saying, this proves that Jesus, unlike David, whose remains could be found in a grave somewhere. This Jesus, though they had killed him, Jesus, he rose from that grave. He said it wasn't possible for death to hold on to him. And he says, God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He has triumphed in it. Uh, Revelations chapter five, verse five and six. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, John, this is John the Apostle, and he has this vi vision. He's seeing that there is this book we might call the Book of Destiny, and it had to be a worthy person to open it, and he's told no one is worthy to open it. And here this elder apostle now is weeping. He's given his life in service to his Lord. Is this what it comes to? No one now is worthy to open this Book of Destiny? And yet the, the elder says to him, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I look and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. How about it? He was told about a lion, and yet when he looks, he sees a lamb as though it had been slain, the scars of Calvary having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. There is the unquestionable evidence that the Lord Jesus Christ has won. He has triumphed in the matter of redeeming us unto God. If you go on and read after those verses, that's where you have that eruption of praise and where a multitude, a throng of voices come together 
and say, you are worthy to receive the glory because you have redeemed us unto God by your blood. The Lord redeems his people. All right, next in, in our psalm, picking up with verse number eight, the Lord rescues his people. In verse eight through 14 now, he rescued us from our helplessness. That speaks of our condition, our helplessness. Now note how this is described here. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfied the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Those who sat in darkness and the shadow of death bound in affliction and irons because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. Well, a few things could be noted here. In verse number nine, there's the promise of the Lord's sufficiency. Again, we have this reminder, verse nine, he satisfies the longing soul. He fills the hungry soul with good, goodness. You see, there is a need in every heart that can only be met by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, people are trying everything else under the sun. You name it, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, pursuing after and trying to get that to fill that void that they'll never fill. It is an opening that only a sovereign Lord can fill. He satisfies the longing soul. Oh, soul, are you weary? Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. In verse 10, 11, and 12, he talks about the predicament of the sinner. He describes him as sitting in darkness in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons, and it's because that they rebelled against the words of God. You see, now you and I should not go around saying to people, I told you so, I told you so, but God can. And God is telling us so that to rebel against his word is not wise and it will not go well. And that's what happens here. And so therefore, the Bible talks about how God humbles them. He brings them down with their labor. And he says, they fell down, nobody, nobody. Refuge failed them. No one seemed to care to offer at all. Here they are in a helpless state. But then verse 13 to 14, you've got the picture of salvation. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. Boy, that is salvation summarized, isn't it? Coming out of, the, out of the bondage and out of the darkness of sin into his glorious light and liberty. He rescued us from our helplessness, our condition. Then verse 15 through 20, he rescued us from our foolishness. And this has to do with our choices because the natural man makes foolish choices. He says, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food. They drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their stresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, rebellious choices have rough consequences. What a man sows, that he shall also reap. You see, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 13, 15, that the way of the unfaithful or some have transgressor is hard. We make it hard on ourselves when we transgress, when we violate, disobey the word of God. You see, we can have foolish choices. 
But godly sorrow, the Bible says, produces repentance that leads to salvation. <coughs> that's what 2 Corinthians 7.10 says. And that's what you have in those last couple of verses. They got down so low in their foolishness. I mean, it just life was now piling on them that they cried out to the Lord. Kind of like the prodigal son, remember? That when he had spent all, he came to himself. Then he wanted the Father to have him. See, we have to get down. We have to get lost. And when we humble ourselves, repent of our sin, we're in the position then to trust the Savior, to say, I need, I need you, O Lord. I need you in my life. Please come in and forgive me, cleanse me. You see, he rescued us from our foolishness. Verse 21 through 30, he rescued us from our hopelessness. Now that's our circumstance. He says, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifice of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits end. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that his waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. Of course, here the, the rider, maybe he's gone down to the dock and he's seeing the, the, the fishing boats, maybe as they're heading out into the waters. Something they did every day, but he knows, you know, sometimes things are different because you see, life has its sudden, unchangeable circumstances. Might be one going on with you right now. And of course, this year, we've seen things really just turn upside down, haven't we? Ever since we have been affected by this uh, coronavirus, I mean, life just, it can change. It can change quickly and it can change drastically. And that's what he's picturing. They're out there on the water and all of a sudden now the tempest comes and the winds, the waves are getting stronger and stronger. And now they're going up and they're going down. And man, probably getting seasick, but man, they're also afraid. Man, they're scared because it looks like they're gonna, they're gonna die. Life can be so hard. Life can come at us in such a fierce way, in such a fast way, something we didn't see coming. And there we are having to face it. Friend, I wanna encourage you today because he teaches right here about his rescue from our hopelessness. In verse 28 through 30, we learn that the Lord alone has sovereign control over life's circumstances. Note verse 29, he calms the storm so that its waves are still. You know, that's exactly what Jesus did, didn't he? Peace be still. And there was a great calm. What manner of man is this? And even the winds and the waves obey him. Well, there's a storm in the soul and we need the master of the sea to speak to us and say, peace, be still. I'm telling you, the Lord is able to do that. You see, the Lord is able to secure us through our difficulties. And the Lord is able to secure our destiny. Now both are important. The journey in this life, he can secure and sustain you through the trials. And yet the day will come and he will secure you into his glorious presence in heaven. Mark chapter 4 and verse 35, Jesus said to disciples, let's pass over to the other side. He takes a nap. Yep, the storm comes. They're afraid. They wake him up. He stands and he rebukes the winds and the waves. And then he rebukes them about their lack of faith. But chapter 5 and verse 1, right after that account, it says, And they came over to the other side. 
the very thing Jesus had said to them, let's pass over to the other side. And they came over to the other side. Friend, when the Lord saved me way back in 1969, I didn't appreciate it then, but looking back, I do now. When the Lord came into my life, it's as if he said, Jack, let's pass over to the other side. Now the journey has been ongoing since then. And the length of it is in his hands. But the day will come, and it may be very soon, the day will come when I, by the Spirit of God, I'm going to pass over to the other side. Amen and amen. He rescues us from our hopelessness. So the, the Lord redeems His people. The Lord rescues His people. Verse 31 through 43, the final verses of this psalm. Hey, the Lord is is real to his people. The Lord is real to his people. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. He turns rivers into wilderness and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. He turns a wilderness into pools of water and dry land into water springs. There he makes the hungry dwell, that they may establish a city for a dwelling place, and sow fields and plant vineyards, that they may yield a fruitful harvest. He also blesses them, and they multiply greatly, and he does not let their cattle decrease when they are diminished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He pours contempt on princes and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet he sets the poor on high, far from affliction, and makes their families like a flock. Not very likely the writer there is recalling the events of the past and how he has seen the Lord come down on some individuals who had oppressed the Israelites. Then in verse number 42, he says, the righteous see it and rejoice, and all iniquity stops its mouth. He has seen how that the Lord not only could shut the mouth of the lion, he could shut the mouth of a king. He says, Who, who's, whoever is wise will observe these things, and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Now, there is nothing about the Bible that really is meaningful to the natural, to the unsaved man. In fact, the only thing that is attractive to the lost person is the gospel when that person is under conviction of sin. Until then, the Bible teaches that they consider us to be fools. Fools for Christ's sake. You're a fool to believe that. You're a fool to believe in someone that you said was here 2,000 years ago that supposedly died horrendous death and supposedly rose again the third day. Why? Why, you're a fool to believe that. Perhaps in their eyes we are. But just remember, we're either a fool for Christ's sake or we're a fool who says no to God. I'll take the first one, amen? I'll be a fool for Christ's sake. But you see, we know by the Holy Spirit the Lord is real. In verses 33 through 36, his people know the reality of his greatness. We know, if look, look back at verse 33, he turns rivers into a wilderness. Verse 35, he turns a wilderness into pools of water. If you read 33 and 34 and then read 35, 36, you see it's like they're opposites. In other words, the Lord can do either thing, either one. The Lord can do what he pleases and nobody can stop him from it. We are in a season, a period of time, of where the Lord is allowing man the opportunity to hear the gospel. But there is a stop sign at some point. And a lot of folks right now ridicule the gospel and ridicule the name of Christ. But I tell you what, we serve a Lord who can do whatever he pleases. And we need to be very grateful that it pleased him to have the preaching of the gospel. Because that's how he's designed for people to be saved. What the world calls foolishness 
It's the power of God and the salvation. And so you see, we know the reality of his greatness, that he is an awesome God and worthy to be feared. In verse 37 through 41, his people know the reality of his grace. See there, he's talking about all the, the good things he does for his people. In, in fact, in verse uh, 39, I like he says, he, uh, verse 38, he also blesses them. Oh, that's obvious, isn't it? I mean, that's really the, in a nutshell, we are blessed, extremely blessed. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And yet we know every bit of it is undeserved. It's grace. It is grace and all grace. Nothing we've deserved. It is completely grace. We know, we know the reality of his grace. But then verse 42, 43, his people know the reality of his goodness. The righteous see it and rejoice. Oh, let's pray to be more perceptive, but let us be careful to take note of the good things of the Lord. It's so easy to get caught up with the world and just be critical and cynical and complain about everything. But beloved, God is good to us. And God has, has given us good things in life. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord, the songwriter wrote, oh, how good God is to us. He could have totally ignored us. He could have, he could have left us to our own, but he didn't. In fact, Paul in Romans 2 said, it's the goodness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. And so perhaps right now, as we have rapidly gone through these 43 verses. Could it be the word is speaking to your heart today? Could it be that you have forgotten about your merciful deliverer who redeemed you, who rescued you, who at one time was even more real to you? You need to come back to him. There's another R, right? Repent. Come back to the Lord today. Be encouraged, my friend, whatever may be going on in your life. Oh, I pray in these trying times that the Lord is real, that you have a relationship with Him. You know God is your Father. The Lord Jesus is described as our elder brother. How about that? And the Holy Spirit is the paraclete, the comforter, the one who walks right alongside of us bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. May you be blessed today. Blessed to remember how blessed you are. Let me pray. Father, your word is true and your word is timeless and yet also very timely. Thank you for reminding us of the wonderful things you have done in our lives. Oh, that we would give thanks to your name, that we would praise you, God, for redeeming us, rescuing us, and yes, oh Lord, making yourself real in our lives. We thank you. May some listener through this message come to know Jesus as personal Savior. I pray in his name. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. If you'd like to connect to us, you can reach us online at tarlandingbaptist.org. There you can find helpful links such as social media, additional sermons, email addresses for pastoral staff, as well as mailing addresses and telephone numbers. Thank you for watching.